I'm not pulling out of the driveway. We all know what that means. It's time for another Drive to Work Coronavirus Edition. Okay, so last time I had Richard Garfield and we were talking about Arabian Nights, but 30 minutes was not enough. So uh, it's part two. So welcome, Richard. Hi. Okay, so... Uh, Good to be back. Last we left, we, we started talking about some cards. So uh, I think we'll... I might ask you a few questions about the set in general, but I, I definitely want to get to some, some individual card stories because it's fun to talk about how individual cards got made. Um, sure. So I'm going to start with one that has always fascinated me, uh, Jeweled Bird. So let me, let me read it, and then we can talk about how, how Jeweled Bird got made. So it, it's an artifact, a mono artifact, as it, as it was written on the card. Um, uh, it costs one generic mana. Uh, draw a card and exchange Jewel Bird for your contribution to the ante. Your former contribution goes to your graveyard. Remove this card from your deck before playing if you're not playing for ante. So but you you have to first explain to our audience what ante is, since for a lot of them, they have no idea what that is. Yeah, uh, uh, ante is, is, is a pretty interesting stage in Magic. Um, uh, when Magic first came out, uh, an official part of the rules was that you would cut your opponent's deck and, and flip up the top card, and that was the stakes of the battle. Uh, and I fully expected players to not play that way when they didn't want to, uh, but uh, but having grown up playing things like marbles, uh, where it was more exciting to play marbles for keeps, uh, that uh, it was something I also expected a lot of players to like doing, to add a little spice to their game. Um, the other reason why I liked Anti was that uh, I, I figured that a lot of players wouldn't feel comfortable trading cards. Uh, it was something that, uh, that, uh, that that's the sort of interaction which sometimes makes uh, players uncomfortable. And, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, I wanted to make sure that cards circulated uh, in the environment. I didn't want the same person to be stuck with the same deck forever. Uh, even if they didn't want to uh, uh, engage with trading, uh, and uh, and so anti was a way to to change that, where they would lose some cards and have to adapt to that and gain some cards. Um, and and this was before Magic was such a huge success that 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 really wasn't an issue. There was just so many cards floating around that people uh, that uh, that that. Building new decks out of the collection was generally not a problem, and uh, even the lowest, the, the person with the lowest tolerance for engaging with other people didn't mind trading in the sense that uh, other people would give them all their common cards, that sort of thing. Uh, so it became less important, uh, uh, and that's one of the reasons it disappeared. I mean, it disappeared really because uh, my estimation of how much people liked it was was way out of kilter, and most people really hated it. Um, and uh, and that's that's certainly understandable because uh, we had trouble uh, keeping up with the printing at the beginning, and so cards were were much much more valuable than I expected. They were much. It was hard. It was so hard to get cards that of course you didn't want to lose them just to random card flips. And so uh, I think I think it was the wrong decision, even if we could have kept up with uh, demand. But uh, as it was, it was doomed from the start. Um, anyway, that brings us to Jeweled Bird. Yes. <laughs> um, and so Jeweled Bird uh, allows you to uh, have some power to manipulate uh, what the ante was. Uh, and uh, I forget, does this, this replaces the ante with the Jeweled Bird, is that correct? Uh, yeah, exchange Jeweled Bird for your contribution. So instead of the normal card you have ante, you've now anteed up the Jeweled Bird instead. Yeah, so... so Clearly, this was done before we had killed uh, the concept of, uh, of ante. And, uh, um, but I still liked the idea of playing with that as a mechanic, uh, even though uh, I think I could probably see the writing on the wall. And, uh, and the jeweled bird, um, I, I honestly forget whether it comes from a specific story or it's a general thing that appears a bunch of Arabian Nights. Uh, but uh, but there were definitely I think there might have been a bunch of jeweled birds floating around, but there might have been a story I was thinking about at the same time. But it, it, it's this uh, uh, um, it's it's basically a treasure, and this idea that you give up this treasure in exchange for another treasure that might have come up in one of my stories. I, I don't remember. Um, 
one of the interesting things about it, though, was I remember I wanted to make this card uh, in some sense free. Uh, and uh, um, at the in those days, what it meant to be a free card was still evolving. There were a lot of players who felt that if it costs zero, it's free. And when um, Ornithopter was published, which was a zero zero cost card for zero two, I think. Yeah, zero two flyer. Yeah, people thought that was just, it was a broken card. It was like dividing by zero uh, <laughs> because they didn't recognize that the major cost uh, was the card itself. Um, and, uh, and, and Jeweled Bird sidestepped that in a different way because when you played the card, you drew a card to replace it. So there was no cost in some sense to it other than its, uh, its, its mana cost. Um, and, and so some people cite that as being the first cantrip, even though it wasn't until later that we began to think of cantrip, of cantrip in the same way as a sort of standard way to make, uh, make a cost adjustment. Right. Ice, Ice Age would introduce cantrips, and that, that was, I mean, I guess Ice Age existed at the time in your mind because it was something that had been worked on, but... Yeah, I, m- I might have... Uh, it's possible the term cantrip was around back then, but I don't think so. I think that really started to... Uh, that thought really started to uh, um, evolve when we were arguing that uh, Ornithopter was not the most broken card of magic. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there's two possibilities. Uh, one is that after that hit, we began to think of that as a, that term separately and possibly was at that point that Arabian Nights started to add cantrips proper, um, because Arabian, I mean, sorry, uh, uh, Ice Age started, might've started to add them that way later, or I could have that just the timeline wrong and that might've been there already. Uh, so, so yeah, I don't really remember. Okay, next thing I'd like to ask you about is the gins and Afrits. So every color but but white uh, had a gin and had an Afrit. Um, probably Juzem Jin and Urnum Afrit, Urnum Jin are probably the two most famous of that of that cycle. What what prompted the gin and Afrit? I'll call it a cycle. It's missing in white, but it's it's in the other four colors. Yeah. Uh, well. It was there because jinns and afrits are just such common elements of the Arabian Nights that it felt like uh, they were a generic element, like the like the uh, jackals and the and the asps and the whatever the desert storms and the nomads uh, that they should be part of the common background, uh, and and so that's why I wanted to have a lot of them. And, uh, and being is that they, uh, I wanted them to be generic rather than specific. Uh, uh, that's why they've all got, uh, I I think all of them, no, no, some some of them have genuine Arabian names. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but a lot of them, as, as, as we mentioned before, are, uh, uh, Easter eggs, uh, named for, uh, family members and, uh, and friends. And, uh, um, and so that's, that's why they are there. Uh, and the reason why it's a partial cycle uh, is is because uh, there's some conflict. To me, uh, white mana at the time had this uh, uh, religious sense to it, in addition to whatever place it had in the context of magic, and um, that seemed to be uh, even within the context of Arabian Nights. Uh, sort of, there seemed to be something. Uh, where these, this whole lot of guys was, uh, was, there was something that opposed it that didn't have gins and afrits. And, and so I wanted to maintain that a little bit. Uh, yeah. and, so, and so that's why it was a partial cycle. Yeah, the, 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 car, uh, the set did have King Suleiman in white, by the way, which was uh, a 1 1 creature that you could tap to destroy a gin or a free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, th- so it was that sort of thing where it was sort of the, there was, uh, it felt to me like white should be the anti gin and anti afrit color. I forgot about Solomon, yeah. Okay, so we, something we, we touched upon last time, but we didn't really get into depth. One of the things that intrigues me as a sort of history of, you know, a historian of magic design is you really started exploring lands in a way that, like I said, Alpha really just tapped for mana. Uh, and here, so there's Bizarre Baghdad, 
uh, Desert, Diamond Valley, Elephant Graveyard, I Want to Walk Walk, Library of Alexandria. There's also City of Brass, but that was that just produces mana. Um, and, 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 and and Oasis. Um, what what sort? I want to walk you down. What got you to start doing other things with lands? Like where did that come from? Well, it's, it's certainly a natural thing. And and I think I mentioned last time that I wasn't sure whether this was brewing in my head at the end of uh, uh, Magic the Gathering development or not. But but now that you list those uh, those cards, uh, I, I'm thinking that that this is a consequence of the top down design. That I had all these things that I really wanted to have in the game, and Many of them sounded like lands, and that's almost certainly where it came from. And so that's that really made me expand what I what I was doing with the lands because uh, once you you have, uh, for instance, the island of Walk Walk, you want to put that in the game. You can't make it a creature. It's kind of lame to make it an artifact. Uh, so it's an island. Uh, and then and then how are we going to make a whole bunch of islands that uh, reflect? what they do in the stories as best I can, well, you're going to begin uh, sort of expanding your toolkit some. So it's interesting that some of the lands you still have produced mana and some of them don't produce mana. How did you decide which ones produced mana and which ones didn't produce mana? Uh, it, uh, I would have to see them case by case. I'm sure that if they had, I'm sure the ones that didn't, uh, I had a specific, I, I was trying to reflect that place as I saw it within the mythos uh, that I was uh, uh, designing for. Um, so uh, easy is Library of Alexandria. Um, uh, having that be not for uh, mana, but having it be for cards is natural ah, because it's a library. It does have for mana. So uh, oh, does it? <laughs> yeah, so City of Brass, Desert, Elephant Graveyard, and Library of Alexandria uh, and the mountain, um, all tap for mana. Bizarre Baghdad, Diamond Valley, I Want to Walk, Walk, and Oasis didn't tap for mana. Okay, so let, let's go through these. Um, so, but, but, uh, so here, library did tap for cards as well. Correct, right? correct. So, um, let me read these just so people may not know the card, Rich, Richard. Library of Alexandra is, uh, once again, I'm reading the original Arabian Nights version because it's fun to read that. Uh, tap to add one colorless mana to your mana pool. Or draw a card from your library. You may only use the card drawing ability if you have exactly seven cards in your hand. That sounds right. And so that, that, that obviously okay. that was capturing like 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 it was a place of knowledge, right? Right, right. It's a place of knowledge, and and we we had had uh, uh, yeah a lot having a library be card draw very natural from the base set, um, and uh, and you wouldn't expect that in fact to be out of place in Magic today. Uh, as a uh, as a connection, um, the uh, the reason why I've got the mana there is probably because uh, I was um, uh, not. It's it's a little hard for me to get into my head back then, but uh, it, I imagine that that I did not want to completely disassociate the two because uh, because you're you're going to still need some mana in your deck. And uh, and and it might be difficult uh, if you've got a lot of cool abilities on these cards uh, that you want to play with to put them in your deck because they're taking the slot of your mana production, so it could end up posing you. So that that could have been my, my head with uh, trying to put on mana where it was natural as often as possible. Okay, so let's like, talk. Like there, like there, the, the ability is so simple; it's easy to attack mana on. Yeah. Uh, unlike something like we talked uh, uh, about uh, uh, Drop of Honey, reflecting that story on a card, you know, I don't think it quite moves you to microtext, but it's, you know, it's getting close. Okay, so let, let's talk about uh, Bizarre Baghdad is probably the most famous of the non, the ones that don't tap for, for mana. So Bizarre Baghdad says, tap to take two cards from your library, after which you must immediately discard three from your hand to your graveyard. If you don't have three or more cards in your hand, discard your whole hand. No spells may be cast between drawing and discarding cards. Okay, boy. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's all speculation, but but my guess is that, uh, I mean, that sounds like a bizarre ability. So it's definitely uh, because you're you're drawing and exchanging. Uh, and so uh, definitely top-down design. Um, uh, I was trying to reflect the bizarre. And it's it's quite likely that that was a matter of, uh, of, of 
if I had my brothers, it would tap for a colorless mana as well, but just uh, just was didn't feel like it was necessary that it was desirable, but it's starting to get a little bit wordy. Okay, one one more land I want to talk about, then we'll move some some non lands. Um, Desert, Desert was a really interesting card, and, and it was the one card that um I think it was the land that showed up the most. It was the lowest rarity land, I believe, other than. I'm not sure where Mountain was at, but uh, Desert showed up <laughs> multiple times in the pack, and multiple there were multiple on the sheet. So Desert had the lowest rarity of the lands. What, 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 where did Desert come from? Do you remember the design of Desert? Oh, the audience, real quick. Desert says tap to add one colorless mana to your mana pool, or do one damage to attacking creature after it deals its damage. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, clearly having a bunch of deserts in Arabian Nights felt felt like uh like like something we should aim to do uh and uh um, i i i and anything you want a lot of uh you want it to generate mana uh because it's taking up a drop uh so so i think that was my compromise i wanted to have a lot of debt uh uh deserts uh i didn't want to pin it to a particular color of mana so it's colorless so give a little bonus ability to do damage to creatures seems pretty reasonable um uh, I don't. Yeah, I, 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 I think, I think what I, you know, what what I really wanted was to for deserts to be as prominent a part of that environment as mountains and islands and swamps and so forth were. Just because deserts feel like, uh, I mean, they're not like uh, uh, Bazaar of Baghdad or Library of Alexandria, which feel like a very special thing. Deserts are super generic, uh, on the same level as islands, for, uh, and and so I wanted it to be reflect. So I wanted it to be ultra common, and I was trying to do an ultra common card that people might play with a bunch of. So one of the other interesting things with desert is uh, there's a card called Camel in the set, which is uh, it's a one white mana for zero one. It has uh, it says bands. All creatures attacking in a band with Camel are immune to damage done by deserts. Whoa. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, did, very top down. <laughs> did you did, did you make like when you made deserts? How long was the gap between making deserts and making camel? Uh, it was probably pretty close. Probably pretty close. I, I, I probably you know you know uh, the design process the way I did it where I was uh, reading um, Arabian Nights and uh, uh, taking down notes about what elements uh, I saw in it. Uh, I probably just had this huge list of things, deserts and camels and, you know, uh, uh, asps and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, and, and, and so they were probably pretty close to one another. Okay. So, uh, next I'm going to ask about one of, one of my favorite cards from the set, uh, old man of the sea. So old oh, man yeah. of the sea costs one blue, blue. So three mana total, two, which is blue summon merit. Uh, I'm reading the original Arabian Nights card. Tap to gain control of a creature with power no greater than old man's power. If old man becomes untapped, you lose control of this creature. You may choose not to untap old man as normal. You also lose control of the creature if old man dies or if the creature's power becomes greater than old man and it's a 2-3 creature. Yeah, that, that one certainly has, has a story. Uh, as with a lot of these uh, more elaborate and uh, almost all the rare cards, they have a specific story in mind. Old Man of the Sea, the story was, uh, I think it was a Sinbad story. He uh, goes to this island and uh, some old dude is there and gets him to bend over uh, uh, to help him or something. And then he jumps on his back and uh, squeezes his neck between his thighs. And his thighs, they're strong. They're like nutcrackers. And uh, and so basically he rides around... um, uh, Sinbad for weeks uh, because now he's Sinbad. Sinbad's his horse, and uh, uh, Sinbad em- eventually manages to fool him in some way and 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 and, and get him off and uh, brain him and uh, get go on his merry Sinbad adventure ways. Um, and so that's why Old Man of the Sea takes control of something. Uh, and another interesting aspect of that story is Old Man of the Sea, if you look into it, uh, actually, uh, I think it means orangutan. So uh, uh, orangutan, uh, uh, the roots of that word are old man, man, or something like that. And so the, uh, the supposition, I think, is that he rang into, ran into an orangutan. And that's, 
the orangutan is doing that 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 stuff. Um, and uh, uh, so that 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 that's pretty cool. I mean, the the, the whole Arabian Nights is filled with all of this interesting stuff. Uh, but uh, um, uh, the connection between Old Man of the Sea and orangutan has uh, has helped me in a, a number of trivia competitions. I think, by the way, this might be the first card that you tap and can choose not to untap it to continue its effect. I don't know. Uh, it might be. I don't remember. I don't remember. I know everybody, um, Antiquities does some, but I don't know if ever if Alpha had any. Um, okay, so there's, uh, this reminded me. There's a card called Sinbad in the set. So one blue, one one. Summon Sinbad. Tap to draw a card from your library, but discard that card if it's not a land. Um, I'm more. We can talk about the card in specific, but I'm more interested in this general question is. You had a lot of named, like, Sinbad is specifically this one character from the story. Um, did you ever toy around with the idea of legendary? Is that something that you ever even thought of at the time? Uh, I thought about it, yes. I thought about um, it, but, I, th- uh, but I, think, I think I never seriously entertained uh, restricting you to have one of these guys. And uh, I, I really... And, and, and I really don't like uh, the whole uh, rule of limiting you to one uh, one of a creature in Magic. I find it uh, sort of having the story uh, drive the gameplay. And I think the gameplay is generally weakened by your inability to get more than one at play. And it leads to all sorts of awkward situations like if they're legendaries and you put out a legend and it kills another one. Anyway, you and I have been on design teams. You know that I've got a lot of, uh, of uh, negative feelings about uh, about the legend mechanic. Well, um, j- just so you know, Richard, I'm not sure you're aware of this. I, at, at work, for years, I mean years and years and years, I've been pitching them to d- take legendary and make it a marker, but take off the, the negative uh, writer on it and just say, it's just a marker, things will care about it, but it doesn't come with a necessary back, you know, a negative to it, but I've not yeah. won that fight. So. And of course I would love that. You know, it's like I have no problem with legend as a keyword that is important. Uh, I just don't like the mechanical interpretation. Uh, I think that once you start caring about whether there's uh, two Sinbads in your deck, that you've got a whole lot of more important uh, uh, inconsistencies in the world to worry about. Um, like, yeah, uh, we won't go into it, but uh, but there's just a lot... There's, is like once you start worrying about it, you just you're going to end up hurting gameplay by the end of it. Um, so so yeah, I, I did not really seriously think of limiting uh, limiting Sidban to one. Uh, I did have misgivings about having a named character, um, and uh, I'm sure that 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 I that I thought well maybe have a Sinbad in the day in the game because of that. But in the end, I decided to go with it obviously um, uh, because I thought that the flavor was just too good. Okay, speaking of named characters, here's another one of my, my, my favorite cards from the set first came out. Ali from Cairo. So, two red red, summon Ali from Cairo. It's a zero one creature. When Ali is in play, damage that reduces you to less than one life lowers you to one life. All further damage is prevented. I, I, I cannot remember what it is. It's a specific, obviously, a specific story. Uh, I forget what he is. I think I seem to remember him being a really likable guy, uh, but I, I I really can't remember what his what his shtick is. I'd have to go back and read the original stories. Yeah, one of the things that I, 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 you did in Arabian Nights, I mean, you did someone in Alpha, but really Arabian Nights is really pushing boundaries. Like Scheherazade's another good example where it's really kind of like like I remember when I read this card for the first time, I just couldn't believe you it got printed. I'm like, <laughs> I can't lose while this, this player this creature's out. It just really shocked me in, in a real fun way. So um, so. Uh, yeah, I, I want to uh, bring up one other thing which came to mind when you brought up uh, Old Man of the Sea, and that is Serendib Afrit. Okay. Serendib Jim. Uh, and it's because of the language thing again. Uh, uh, orangutan literally means old man or old man of the sea. I, I forget which. Um, but uh, uh, Serendib also has a uh, similar sort of thing. Serendib uh, literally means uh, a salon. Uh and uh, at C E Y L O N, Ceylon, and uh, um, and this is uh, this is pretty interesting because then that begs the question: uh, Is this related to serendipity? Um, and and weirdly, it is. 
And that word uh, comes about from this uh, 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 novel. I think it was French and it was super popular. I want to say in the 1800s, maybe. Um, and and it had this person do, with all, going through all these adventures. Uh, uh, the, the book itself might have been called Serendib. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, but in any case, he was going through uh, that. He was going through Serendib, Salon. And he kept on getting out of problems just by strange coincidences and happenstance. It was like a sort of sloppy novel writing where, where it's like, oh, and then he stumbled upon the answer to whatever was the problem was. And so people began to refer to that as serendipity. So uh, it's, it's a complete aside from magic, but it's so <laughs> cool that you look at serendib, a freak, and that's Salon, and you look at serendib, and that's the same root as serendipity for this really super weird reason. Well, see, you come for the magic history and you learn all about word uh, so I get <laughs> extra things. <laughs> okay, so the next card I was curious about, uh, Curd Ape. So it's a red mana, single red mana for an ape, summon ape, 1-1. One, one. Curd Ape gets plus 1, plus 2 if you have any forest in play. This was another card that saw a lot of play because it was... Yeah, that was super good. <laughs> it was very good. That, um, uh, yeah. That that is of course uh, one of the issues with uh, you know that we began out with by uh, being uh, really reluctant to put my stamp of approval on this game because it did not have the same play tested. Almost all this stuff was like straight out of my head, uh, straight to the table, and uh, it was play tested. But it was play tested not by my usual players. They were generally uh, I have no idea how much time they were able to put into it because they were really busy with other things, magic related and. Uh, I don't. I have no idea how good they were, but in any case, um, because of that, there were things that um, uh, were overpowered, uh, even more so than than I intended. Um, and anyway, uh, that, the, yeah, that was one of the one of the powerful ones. Uh, what 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 was specifically your question about it? I was curious. Was it just a top down making an ape? Is that that's where it came from? You think? Um, no, that was a common, I believe, and so I think I think Curd Ape was just there were apes in Arabian Nights, and then uh, Curd was one of the uh, um, terms which uh, which 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 was from Arabian, and who knows, it might have meant desert. Uh, I, I forget. I'd have to look it up. I've looked up a bunch of these things, and a lot of them uh, Google doesn't recognize. Uh, um, I pulled them out of the back of some really old tomes, so again, they might have been heavily anglicized. But uh, they are all, all at some level uh, authentic, uh, even if they've been uh, uh, filtered through uh, several levels of uh, unreliable translators, which includes me. Okay, so next card that uh, a lot of this, I, I assume they came from top down. But here, here's, here's a card that, that has caused me some a uh, lot of arguments at R and D. So it's this card called Desert Twister, four green green sorcery, destroy any card in play. Well, this is top down, top down Desert Twister. Um, well, I, I believe that 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 was that's probably a common. Is that a common? Uh, what is? It? I, I can look. I don't think Desert Twister is a common. Hold on a second. I'm I'm looking. Um, it is an uncommon. It is an uncommon. Uh, yeah. My theory is that the. In general, the uh, I believe that the uh, commons were less likely to be top down. They were just generic elements uh, that I built uh, that I built as flavorfully as I could. Um, but uh, but the desert twister being uncommon may have come from a particular story that I forget. Um, uh, uh, but it sure sounds like a, a, a generic term that I just wanted to see in the game as well. Uh, I forget how it was designed, and it was probably green because it's nature. Is that why? Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, as far as the color pie, um, uh, I was, uh, um, I, I, you know, the, the color pie has uh, changed a lot over the years for a number of reasons. The uh, um, the uh, bones of it are certainly there from the start, uh, but. But it was not uh, something which I felt had to be adhered to as strictly as it does these days, and it did back then soon. 
The reason for that is because I viewed the cards as being more limited than they were. So, for example, if you only buy a few decks of cards uh, and you trade with your local play group, it's perfectly fine having uh, whatever things which are out of your color pie in a particular color because generally uh, red does what it's supposed to do. It does a direct damage. And if green has a little bit, that's okay. Um, as it turns out, with the amount of cards that people were getting and the, uh, the, the vo- you know, how enthusiastic the trading market was and everything else, it meant that, that uh, uh, you could have a single common card or uncommon card or rare card. It didn't matter. You could completely disrupt the color pie and you could make it so that uh, whatever made that color special wasn't special anymore. And that wasn't something that I really anticipated. And I don't think I really fully appreciated that uh, for, uh, you know, for, for a while, certainly not, not here. And so um, uh, all my color decisions were sort of guidelines, not rules. And that's what, why, for example, you know, you've got the Psychic Blast in, uh, in uh, Alpha, yeah. the original Magic. It was direct damage in blue, yeah, but, you know, it wasn't very common, so who cares? I mean, I mean, it was common, but it wasn't like a common, you know, right. like a, if you, as you fanned the cards, there wasn't all that much of it. So blue in general was not the direct damage color. Uh, um, since players have so much control over that, I can't do that. You know, we couldn't do that uh, as much as uh, I wanted. Yeah, I mean, one of the things you bring up, which is really interesting, is how, you can't predict what magic became. Like, there's no way you can design it and know where it was going. It, it was not something that was predictable, really. And so a lot of early decisions were based on, yeah, people spend, you know, 20 bucks and, you know, buy a starter and two boosters or something. Like, what what is that game experience? If everybody has a handful of cards, what's that game experience? Right. And that's a, I mean, for me, that was an incredibly ambitious vision, right? Because that's already uh, everybody paying $20 uh, to play a game, which you would imagine normally one person would buy for $20 to entertain their group with. So, uh, so that's already whatever four times more more than mm-hmm. somebody has a right to hope for, and yeah. the fact that that was you know orders of magnitude off was uh, was you know was was just something beyond my uh, prediction, way beyond. So anyway, I, I I can see my desk here from in, in the distance. <laughs> um, is there anything about Rami Nice we didn't touch upon since this is our, our wrap up here? Any anything you wanted to touch upon that we didn't talk about about Rami Nights? Uh, Maybe, uh, oh boy, there was one thing with Island, with, 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 uh, where, gosh, there was one land where you tapped it and sacrificed a creature and you got something. Oh yeah, Diamond Valley. Diamond Valley. Yeah, the story behind Diamond Valley is just another, uh, another one which is, uh, pretty cool. You, I mean, every one of these ones you can, like Arabian Nights is just, just good reading. It's a lot of fun. But can you, uh, let, me, let me say the card before you explain the story of the card, just okay. so the audience knows the card. Diamond Valley, it's land. Tap to sacrifice one of your creatures in exchange for a number of life points equal to its toughness. Note that this ability may be used after blocking has been declared. That, that, that's the original Arabian Nights wording. Yeah, so uh, I think this was another Sinbad card. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't swear to that. But uh, some adventurer um, ended up on this island with a bunch of merchants, and there was this valley uh, um, that they were all standing on the edge of with cliffs. And, um, and the valley was filled with diamonds. Uh, there was just diamonds everywhere down there. But it was so treacherous down there because of the poisonous snakes uh, that were there that you couldn't go down there. And so what they would do is, uh, I forget exactly, but it was something like they would be killing their... Uh, their uh, uh, camels and tying ropes to them and throwing them off the edge and then pulling them up and pu- pulling the pulling the uh, uh, the diamonds from the corpses uh, for some reason that that was the best source of sticky material they had <laughs> uh, and uh, and so anyway that is the story behind this really sort of weird card anyway they all have stories like that it's pretty cool and uh, and the yeah, Arabian Nights is just uh, as a as a, a, a mythos a lot of fun so, so the takeaway from from these two podcasts is go Reba Arabian Nights and Sandman number fifty. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I may have that number wrong. I haven't looked it up, but yeah, it's a, a, if you if you look up Sandman uh, City in a Bottle, that's uh, that's the name of that might be the name of the uh, the issue. It's really good. 
Well, anyway, okay. R- Richard, I want to thank you. This has been a lot of fun. And it, uh, it's very funny. I, I tend to do all these podcasts where I talk about stuff that I did. So it's really fun to talk with somebody else about what they did. So um, it, it, it's, I, as a historian, this, I, I, I eat this stuff up. It's, it's, it's really fun to me to hear how the individual stuff got made and stuff like that. So I get to be the fanboy for this episode. So that's yeah. fun. Well, <laughs> Well, thank you. I hope uh, I hope it finds some resonance with the people who listen to you. So, guys, I'm at my desk, so we all know that what that means. It means at the end of my drive to work. So instead of talking magic, it's time for me to be making magic. So, Richard, thank you so much for being on both these episodes. Um, I have to have you back in the future. We'll talk about other sets you've done. So That'll be great. Look forward to it. Okay, guys, I will see you all next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>